Welcome to BEFM Drama, where we turn great works of English literature into gripping radio. I'm your host, Joshua Cornwell, and this week we're bringing you our five-part adaptation of The Adventure of Charles Augustus Milverton, a classic Sherlock Holmes detective story from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Charles Milverton was a master criminal, a heartless blackmailer who threatened women with the revelation of their most embarrassing private secrets if they refused to pay him huge sums of money. Hired by one of the man's victims to secure her letters, Holmes tried and failed to negotiate with the criminal. Knowing he had no other choice, Holmes desperately resolved to secure the letters by other means, and together with his friend Dr. Watson, embarked on a daring burglary of Milverton's home. Interrupted in their task by the arrival of Milverton himself, Holmes and Watson have just watched in amazement as the master criminal was murdered in front of them by one of the noble women whose lives he ruined. Holmes may feel no pity for the criminal, but he and Watson must now finish their task and escape from Milverton's property while avoiding the members of his household who have been woken by the sudden shocking sound of gunshots from their master's study on a windswept stormy night. For a moment after the stunning murder of Milverton and the disappearance of the mysterious woman who'd avenged herself against him, I stood frozen in my hiding place behind the curtain. No interference upon our part could have saved the man from his fate, but as the woman poured bullet after bullet into Milverton's cowering body, I had been about to leap out when I felt Holmes's cold, strong grip upon my wrist. I understood the whole argument of that firm, restraining hand, that it was no business of ours, that justice had come for a villain, and that we had our own duties and our own goals which must not be lost sight of. Hardly had the woman rushed from the room when Holmes, with swift, silent steps, was over at the other door. He turned the key in the lock, sealing us inside. At the same moment, we heard shouting voices in the house and the sound of hurrying feet. The woman's revolver shots had woken the household. With perfect coolness, Holmes slipped over to the still half-open safe, filled his two arms with neat packages of letters, and dumped them all into the fire. Again and again he did this, until the safe was completely empty. Someone turned the handle of the door and began to pound upon the outside with his fists. Holmes looked quickly around. The letter which had been the messenger of death for Milverton lay, all mottled with his blood upon the table. Holmes plucked it up and tossed it in among the other blazing papers. Then he drew the key from the veranda door, pushed me through and quickly followed, and locked the door behind us from the outside. This way, Watson. If we run, we can climb the garden wall in this direction. I could not believe that the alarm had spread so quickly. Looking back, the huge house was one blaze of burning electric light. The front door was open, and man-shaped figures were rushing up and down the drive. The whole garden was alive with people, and one fellow raised a furious shout as we emerged from the veranda and rushed towards us, following hard at our heels as we ran for our lives. Holmes seemed to know the property perfectly, and he threaded his way quickly among a plantation of small trees. I was close at his heels, and our foremost pursuer was panting just behind us. The six-foot garden wall suddenly barred our path, but Holmes sprang to the top and over. As I tried to do the same, I felt the hand of the man behind me grab at my ankle, but I kicked myself free of him and scrambled over a grass-strewn coping. I fell upon my face among some bushes, but Holmes had me on my feet in an instant, and together we dashed away across the huge open expanse of Hampstead Heath. We had run two miles, I suppose, before Holmes at last halted and listened intently. All was absolute silence behind us. We had shaken off our pursuers and were safe. We stood together panting and wheezing for breath for several minutes before Holmes finally spoke. All right, Watson, let us dispose of these ridiculous masks and then see if we cannot find our way off this blasted heath and into a cab bound for Baker Street.
We had breakfasted and were smoking our morning pipe on the morning after the remarkable experience which I had just recounted, when Mr. Lestrade, of Scotland Yard, very solemn and impressive, was ushered into our modest sitting room. Good morning, Mr. Holmes. Good morning. May I ask if you are very busy just now? Not too busy to listen to you? I thought that, perhaps, if you had nothing else keeping you busy just now, you might care to assist me in a most remarkable case, which occurred only last night at Hampstead. Dear me, what was that? A murder. A most dramatic and remarkable murder. I know how keen you are to study these things, and I would take it as a great favor if you would step down with me to Appledore Towers in Hampstead and give us the benefit of your advice. It is no ordinary crime. We have had our eyes upon this Mr. Milverton for some time, and between ourselves, he was a bit of a villain. He is known to have held papers which he used for blackmailing purposes. These papers have all been burned by the murderers. No article of value was taken, as it is probable that the criminals were men of good position, whose sole goal was to prevent some indecent and deplorable social exposure. Criminals? Plural? Yes, there were two of them. They were very nearly captured red-handed, I tell you. They only escaped by a hair's breadth out onto the heath. We have their footprints. We have their description. It's ten to one odds that we trace them successfully. The first fellow was a bit too active, but the second one was caught for a moment by the under-gardener and only got away after a struggle. He was a middle-sized, strongly built man, square jaw, thick neck, mustache, a mask over his eyes. That's rather vague. My, it might even be a description of Watson. Lestrade chuckled at my friend's words in amusement. What you say is true. It might very well be a description of Watson. No disrespect, Doctor. None taken, Inspector. Well, I'm afraid I can't help you, Lestrade. The fact is that I knew this fellow Milverton, and that I considered him one of the most dangerous and evil men in London, and that I think there are certain crimes which the law cannot touch, and which therefore, to some extent, justify private revenge. No, it's no use arguing. I have made up my mind. My sympathies are with the criminals rather than with the victim in this instance, and I will not involve myself in either the case or its investigation. For the remainder of that morning, Holmes said not one word to me about the tragedy which we had witnessed, but I observed that he spent his time in a most thoughtful mood, and he gave me the impression, from his vacant eyes and his abstracted manner, of a man who is striving with all his might to recall some detail to his memory. We were in the middle of our lunch when he suddenly sprang to his feet and cried out, By Jove, Watson, I've got it! Take your hat, come with me! We hurried at top speed down Baker Street and out along Oxford Street until we had almost reached Regent Circus. Here on our left-hand side, there stood a shop window filled with photographs of the celebrities and beauties of the day. Holmes' eyes fixed themselves upon one of them, and following his gaze, I saw a picture of a regal and stately lady in court dress with a high diamond tiara upon her noble head. I looked at that delicately curved nose, at the marked eyebrows, at the straight mouth and the strong little chin beneath it. Then I caught my breath as I suddenly recognized the beautiful Avenger of the previous night and read the time-honored title of the great nobleman and statesman whose wife she had been. My eyes met those of Holmes, and he put a finger to his lips as we turned away from the window. Don't say a word, Watson. Not one word. With that, we've come to the end of our story. In his efforts to complete his task and save his client from disgrace and ruin, Holmes became an unintentional observer of an entirely separate drama, the well-deserved vengeance of a proud and resolved woman against the man who ruined her husband and drove him into suicide. 
Approached by Lestrade to investigate the very crimes of which he was himself a part, Holmes has refused, preferring to let the lady escape the narrow boundaries of the law now that her well-deserved vengeance has been enacted against the man Holmes once called the worst in London. With the story's end, Holmes has come to know the identity of the woman he and Watson saw in the blackmailer's office, emptying her silver revolver into his body and grinding her boot heel into his face in contempt. But the secret of her identity will go with the detective and Dr. Watson to their graves, as neither man would ever speak her name in public or put her at risk of facing the police for what she's done. Holmes has his own peculiar sense of justice, and as far as he cares, in this case, justice has been done. We hope that you've enjoyed our adaptation of this classic tale, and that you'll be joining us again next week for another exciting episode of BEFM Drama. Remember to check out our Sunday compilation episode and to view our show page on befm.or.kr to find links to our YouTube playlist where you can enjoy our episodes complete with English subtitles for your listening pleasure. From our studio in Busan, this is your host, Joshua Corden.